place. I'm going to talk about bloodletting practices in the U.S. Just kidding. <laughs> but now that I have your attention, I have no disclosures to make. Our objective today is to uh, understand the diagnostic criteria for pediatric bacterial rhinosinusitis, understand the utility of imaging, uh, as well as the treatment options. So to kind of review the anatomy, there are four paired sinuses. The no. There are the maxillary sinuses, the frontal sinuses, the ethmoids, and the sphenoids. So the things to remember is that in kids, the maxillary and ethmoid sinuses are um, pretty much the most developed at birth. And so they're the ones that are going to be uh, most relevant to in younger kids. The sphenoids start to um, become uh, imageable by around age three to five, and then they don't get fully developed until about early adolescence. The frontal sinuses aren't typically present at birth, and they start to become aerated around five or six, um, and then reach adult size by about late, uh, late adolescence. So this is relevant because in kids under 13, they're treated a little bit differently from kids over 13. And over 13, they're, they're more like adults. So the diagnostic criteria, um, verbiage is a little bit different in the different, um, different uh, organizations, but luckily they all mostly agree with each other. Uh, so it's mostly based off of history. If you have persistent illness, meaning nasal obstruction, nasal discharge, and cough that lasting uh, over about 10 days without improvement, or you're having a double worsening, so you're starting to get better and then you're worsening again, um, or you have a severe onset with a fever over 102 degrees with purulent nasal discharge for at least three consecutive days. Now, one of the biggest differences between kids and adults is that in kids, cough is a lot more of a significant factor than loss of a sense of smell uh, compared with adults. And the um, differences between acute, subacute, and chronic is mostly just time. If it's uh, under a month, it's acute. If it's one to three months, it's subacute. If it's over three months, it's chronic. Recurrent acute, this is more for adults, really, but it's four episodes within 12 months. And then um, it's important to differentiate, of course, upper uh, respiratory infections that are viral versus bacterial um, because, uh, you know, six to eight episodes a year for kids is uh, average for um, upper respiratory infections. And then about 5 to 10% of those go on to become acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. Um, and so when it goes on to become chronic, it becomes a you know, fair amount of disease burden, about 5.6 million visits per year. Um, and then on quality of life um, uh, questionnaires, they found that kids who had chronic bacterial rhinosinusitis that were about to go to surgery, you ask them what their quality of life is, and they actually had lower scores than all the other chronic uh, pediatric um, diseases, including ADHD, psychiatric disorders, juvenile arth uh, rheumatoid arthritis, epilepsy, and asthma. So this is a fair amount of disease burden here. So um, again, most of it is based off of history and not imaging. And so the American Academy of Pediatrics actually has a strong recommendation not to image kids um, to try to distinguish acute bacterial sinusitis from a viral upper respiratory infection. And the reason for this, there was actually a study that was done that imaged basically everybody within three days of an upper respiratory infection. And 88% of them had mild to severe um, abnormalities on CAT scan. Um, and then you think, well, maybe I could just get a plain x-ray. And while that does have some utility, they are fairly inaccurate. So this is um, not the same kid, but this is just an x-ray versus a sinus CT. Just to kind of give you the differences, you can see on CT, if you see kind of black going right to white, that's a pretty clear sinus. The other side, obviously, not so much. 
So if you compare plain radiographs versus CAT scan in a prospective study um, of 70 kids with recurrent sinusitis, uh, about 75% of them did not have x-rays that correlated with their CAT scans. So 45% of them that had normal plain x-rays had at least one abnormality on their CAT scan. And the converse, about 35% with abnormal plain x-rays had a normal CT. So the conclusion is that you can over and underdiagnose uh, sinusitis on plain um, radiographs. So if you do end up getting imaging, usually we go for a CT of the sinuses or maxillofacial CT. Usually we do it without contrast unless we're suspicious of some kind of complication like an abscess into the orbiter brain to kind of reminisce on our 830 uh, Dr. Amami's talk about complications. And if you are thinking, um, if it does look like there's uh, complications like that, we would actually um, consider an MRI as well. And a negative CAT scan, that does not show sinus disease effectively rules out sinusitis. Okay? And in kids, um, I am pretty careful about ordering imaging because of this 2012 study that says that yes, you can have a slightly increased rate of um, malignancy, about one additional case of leukemia or brain tumor per 10,000 CTs of the head obtained in childhood. That doesn't mean I don't get it, but just to be careful about it. And so when do I order imaging? Um, when um, we are starting to think about going to sinus surgery. And in kids, this doesn't happen all that often, and I'll talk about why. Um, so we want to evaluate anatomy and extent of disease because we're thinking about sinus surgery. And usually when we're doing that, if of course, if you have a negative CT and you've completely ruled out disease, that's helpful as well. Uh, and of course, complications of sinusitis like the swollen eyeball. And if you see a kid with a swollen eyeball, CAT scan to try to figure out if there are sinus disease that's doing this versus is it just an orbital or an eye complication. Okay, so management in a Allergies is an important part um, because a lot of kids might actually just have allergies since a lot of this was based off of just history. Um, usually I will go ahead and manage their allergies, put them on a nasal steroid spray, do some antihistamine, see if it goes away, if that um, seems like it's their primary problem, sometimes even um, allergy testing or even immunotherapy, which incidentally, in children, putting them on immunotherapy can sometimes help to prevent or, or decrease the incidence of going onwards to develop asthma. Nasal saline is a wonderful adjunct. Um, and really, this just helps to increase mucociliary clearance. It helps symptomatically. Nasal steroid spray has anti-inflammatory effects as well as potential decongestant action. Um, systemic steroids, not usually for uncomplicated acute cases, but certainly as part of a treatment plan for uh, chronic, where we're trying to figure out do they need to go to surgery, try to treat them um, to help to get them back to normal. If possible, a culture-directed antibiotic uh, therapy. Um, we usually head towards um, inside the nose, just you know, runny nose isn't super helpful. You want to try to get it as it's coming out of the maxillary sinus and in the middle meatus. And then there was a consensus statement put out by the AAO, so our academy, the Otolaryngology Academy, uh, that um, for chronic uh, sinusitis, a 20-day consecutive course uh, might give you a superior response than a 10-day course. So a little blurb about nasal saline. It has been shown to decrease symptoms of both allergies and sinusitis. These are mostly done in adults, um, but on a questionnaire, SNOT20, yes, a real questionnaire called the SNOT20 <laughs> score, cyanonasal outcome test, a validated questionnaire that just basically asks questions like, you know, uh, did your nose run and how severe are these symptoms? Um, and it did show that just nasal saline by itself reduced those scores. And in kids, we don't tend to do it because most people don't think their kids are gonna tolerate it. So what did they do? They actually did a study on whether or not kids tolerates it. So this is here, they divided, um, they took, I think it was about 70 kids, and uh, they divided it by age, under five, six to 12, and over 13. And they said, um, the first line is, did you think your child would tolerate nasal saline irrigation? And most parents did not think their kids were gonna do it. This was the total score. 
And then this was this number here is how many of the kids actually tried it. I guess the under five year olds had no choice because 100% of them did it. The teenagers were less likely to try it in the first place, but they got most people to try it. And then did your child actually tolerate nasal saline irrigation? And most of them did, over 80% total. And then did it um, help improve your child's symptoms? And agreed, most of them, it did help improve their symptoms. Okay, so this one. So it occurs to me that maybe most people don't know what it looks like to do nasal saline. So it's pretty simple. He, most, most, um, most things they come, there's neti pot, there's Nealmed, there's Kaido Rhino, there's all sorts of products out there. That's essentially you put in this salt packet. A lot of them come with these little salt packets. You just put it in, you add some clean water like distilled water, reverse osmosis. In the United States, tap water is usually safe, and I say usually because if it gets contaminated, it is not safe to put up the nose. So generally speaking, if it's not safe to drink, don't put it up your nose. Okay, um, I invited one of my next door neighbor's uh, kids to demonstrate for us, <laughs> all right? So the key to nasal saline, a lot of people say, I feel like I'm drowning uh, when I do this, and it's because they're trying to breathe through their nose. So if you breathe through your mouth, she's doing it kind of quietly, but she's got her mouth open, she's breathing through her mouth, that closes off the nasal pharynx so that your, that water's just going through one side and running out the other. She does not have a septal perforation, <laughs> okay? This is going all the way to the back of the nose and coming out the other side, and you're just breathing the whole time. You can go through all eight ounces in one go. Okay, so common pathogens, um, strep pneumo, H flu, cataralis, staph, these are all the, the common things we all learn about. And then antibiotic choices, amoxiclav is still considered first line. Uh, you can also do omnicep with beta-lactam aller Allergies, you can consider other things, Bactrim, Azithromycin, Clarithromycin. In older kids, you can consider quinolones, doxycycline. So additional considerations. One of the biggest differences between kids versus adults is adenoiditis. Um, and more about this later. And of course, allergy um, can have a significant uh, role. Um, so in kids, if they're starting to have a lot, if you're gonna chronic sinusitis or a lot of uh, infections, I will also consider screening them for immunodeficiency. And of course, a um, small percentage of kids will have cystic fibrosis. These are usually uh, all lung problems, ear problems, as well as uh, sinus issues. And um, if that's negative, I would also consider primary ciliary dyskinesia. Also important that, to remember that your maxillary sinuses are just above the maxillary dentition. So if they've got really crummy teeth, consider sending them to the dentist and make sure that they don't have an odontogenic source, which of course you um, usually have to take care of the sinus issue as well as the dental issue. Reflux. About 15 years ago now, laryngopharyngeal reflux came on the scene and then ENTs got very, very interested in this whole reflux um, causing ear, nose, and throat problems. For a while, it seemed like reflux was the root of all evil. Um, that's, the fervor has since died down. So yes, reflux can sometimes cause some inflammation, but unless they actually demonstrate reflux symptoms, there's no, no uh, recommendations to just pr empirically treat for reflux. So comorbidities, out of over 4,000 patients, 26.9% also had allergic rhinitis, 12.3% also had immunodeficiency, 4.1% cystic fibrosis, and then much lower, 0.2% had primary ciliary dyskinesia. But just some things to consider that maybe it's not just um, treat with antibiotics, maybe you have to think about underlying conditions as well. So adenoids, I mentioned that this is a much bigger role in kids compared with adults. Um, so some of the data that went with that, um, they took a bunch of uh, kids who had to take out their adenoids and then they imaged them. Now granted, I told you that x-rays were not that um, sensitive or not, not that accurate, but the trend was there that if they had more sinus disease, so uh, they graded it zero to three, more sinus disease, they also had more bacteria that was isolated in their adenoids. Of course, that wasn't the only study. They um, also 
another study, they just took looked at kids that had sleep apnea versus that they had their adenoids out because of chronic rhinosinusitis, and they looked at the adenoids with electron microscopy, um, and they scanned it for the presence of biofilms. And the kids with obstructive sleep apnea had very low surface area of biofilms, so the kids with uh, sinusitis had very high percentage of uh, biofilms, and this was statistically uh, significant. So in kids, first-line therapy for uh, bacterial rhinosinusitis is actually to take out their adenoids. In under six years old, this is um, the American Academy of Otolaryngology had a, an expert panel and they did reach a strong consensus that this is an effective initial surgical therapy for kids under six. Between six and 12, there was less consensus but still um, agreed that uh, it is helpful. Over 12, not so much. Again, they're treated more like adults. Um, now, if someone comes in and they've got nasal obstruction and runny nose, yes, you would consider just checking a lateral neck x-ray to check how large the size of the adenoids is, and you would consider taking out the adenoids just because they were obstructed in the nose. But if they have chronic sinusitis, you don't need to check for a neck x-ray because the size does not correlate to the presence of sinusitis. So if they're coming in with a good enough history for that, I don't need to check an x-ray because it doesn't change what I'm going to do. I would probably still go take out their adenoids. Um, and then, of course, if they are failing all the medical management, once in a while we do have to do sinus surgery, endoscopic sinus surgery. It has been shown to be effective for failure of medical treatment um, or after adenoidectomy. In the past, we were concerned, uh, based off of animal studies, that it could retard um, facial growth, but that has not been shown to be the case in humans. Little brief blurb, um, over the last uh, probably decade or so, balloon sinuplasty has also been gaining um, some favor. And in the pediatric population, the idea was to try to preserve um, tissue. So in case you don't know what that is, it's basically we take a wire and we put it in through the natural ostium, and then we snake a balloon over it and uh, we dilate. And we're just widening the natural ostium there uh, versus in um, normal sinus surgery, you would be taking down walls and making really wide openings. So this is just a quick video. This is the middle turbinate here. This is snaking in that balloon and you just blow the balloon up. So normal sinus surgery, you'd be taking this down. You'd be removing that tissue there. Um, and that's it. That's balloon sinuplasty. How long does that last for? Oh, it's, it's, it lasts. It's, um, and if you fail balloon sinuplasty, you can go on to, um, to the regular uh, fests. Uh, 